Welcome, welcome on this very steamy, steamy Friday uh, to the Divorce Show. We've got for you uh, a healing. Hopefully this one will, will actually happen. We had a, a massive internet issue last week, so we, we missed our healing. So we're going to have uh, some emotional freedom, emotional freedom technique uh, happening later. And um, so get ready for that. We have a shared story with another real life person sharing their story, which we're very grateful for. And we have uh, Jonathan who was sharing his story last week, but this time he's back as the expert in his, uh, as he is in fact a divorce coach. But first of all, we are going to the divorce news. The first of the three, three stories I've got for you today, uh, this one's from The Mirror with Dr. Dre, who reportedly faces losing as much as $1 billion in his divorce from his wife, Nicole Young, as they come to loggerheads over the prenuptial agreement. The rapper, whose real name is Andre Rommel Young, announced in June that he and his wife were filing for, divor filing for divorce and after 24 years of marriage, citing irrecon irreconcilable differences. Too hot to speak this week. But now it's said that a whopping $1 billion is on the line after Nicole claimed that she was forced to sign the prenup back in 1996 and that he later regretted it and tore it up. In a new legal document, or in new legal documents obtained by TMZ, Nicole says her estranged husband is now worth one billion and way more than when they tied the knot. Well, that's what she says. So this isn't, it's quite an interesting story, this one. She continues, Andre acknowledged to me that he felt ashamed he had pressured me into signing a premarital agreement and he tore up multiple copies of the agreement in front of me. Since the day he tore up the agreements, we both understood that there was no premarital agreement and that it was null and void. The Blast reports that Nicole's filing says Dre destroyed the agreements as a grand gesture of his love for Nicole and his desire to have a marriage free of any financial restrictions governing their respective rights and responsibilities. But sources close to the rapper deny everything Nicole is saying. An insider tells TMZ that Dre has never expressed shame over his prenup and that he never tore it up. They say Nicole, who is a lawyer and had her own lawyer as well, has had a clear choice on whether or not to sign the agreement. The sources insist that Dre has made it clear that he will pay spousal support as well as all of Nicole's expenses, but that she wants a bigger chunk of his cash and is claiming that he made most of his fortune during their marriage. She's reportedly, ask, reportedly asking the judge to separate the divorce from the prenup issue. Nicole claims Dre is worth one billion dollars, but Forbes had put his new work net worth at um, well, an estimated a hundred million dollars. It's another world, isn't it? All these numbers. But what interested me about this story was uh, first of all the idea that you'd separate the prenup from the, the marriage. But the whole point of a prenup is that you avoid this sort of uh, argument and fight. Um, and to be fair, there may well be people who do feel pressured into into creating a prenup, but uh, it should be fairly straightforward. Either he's got a copy of it signed or he hasn't. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that one. The next story, we go to Belfast, or to Northern Ireland anyway. Former UTV presenter Linda Bryans is to file for divorce from Ulster Unionist MLA Mike Nesbitt, her husband of 28 years. The revelation comes three months after Mr Nesbitt quit his role in a top Stormont committee after flouting lockdown rules by travelling to the North Coast to stay with a female friend. The former UUP leader said at the time that he had made some very poor decisions and confirmed he had been living apart from Miss Bryans since January. Mr Nesbitt, 62, said he had been a stressful and this had been a stressful and difficult period and apologised over revelations he had made a number of trips to stay at a property in Port Ballintrae, County Antrim. The Belfast Telegraph goes on to say that uh, speaking to the Sunday World newspaper, Miss Bryans confirmed her marriage to the Str Strangford MLA was over. The journalism lecturer at Belfast Met said, I've had enough. I'm filing for divorce. I'm heartbroken, but I will get over it. I am a strong woman with amazing friends, a fantastic family, 
and they have all rallied around me, she said. I'm not going to air my dirty laundry in public, but we have been together for over 30 years, married 28 years. Our wedding anniversary was last month. The 58-year-old said she was publicly humiliated by her husband's secret lockdown meetings with a mystery woman. While she had been prepared to reconcile to, reconcile to save the relationship, Miss Bryans added that she was consulting divorce lawyers. I had hoped for reconciliation some months ago, but we are past that now, she says. In May, Mr Nesbitt resigned as Deputy Chair of the Committee for the Executive Office, which advises government ministers after breaking the lockdown regulations outlined by his party colleague, Health Minister Robin Swan, advising against unnecessary journeys in a bid to stem the spread of the coronavirus. I'm sure there was somebody else in government who did something similar. Anyway, part this this party party leader says Steve Aitken accepted his resigna resignation because this politician decided to actually resign over this, but said the former broadcaster made a huge mistake and he had accepted what he did was wrong. Before entering politics, Mr Nesbitt began his career as a broadcaster, firstly with NBC Northern Ireland, before later joining Ulster TV in 1992. He became one of the channel's biggest names and it was during his time he co-hosted UTV's evening news programme with Miss Bryans. The couple also presented a weekly religious series together, Sunday Morning, for Anglia Television between 1999 and 2001, as well as two series of a house and garden series, Home Sweet Home, for Ulster TV. Well, let's hope they can uh, make the break as peacefully as possible. It must be very difficult, though, when you have got that whole humiliation thing going on, because let's face it, it's the, it's the press putting it out there that's causing even more making it worse for her and not really helping so hopefully she does manage to steer an even keel through this and the last story today before we move on to our expert interview is this is sad this one is from the sun and it's about elvis's only daughter who lost her son benjamin to suicide three weeks ago after he shot himself in the head and and she came face to face with her ex Michael Lockwood in court on Monday. The 52 year old looks distraught, apparently she was pictured going through a McDonald's drive through with a friend. The former couple who split in 2016 after 10 years of marriage are involved in a private court battle expected to last until the end of August which will finally end their marriage four years after they split. Michael is also attempting to obtain primary custody of their 11 year old twins Harper and Finlay. An insider told The Sun exclusively that Michael has hired Joseph Yanni, partner of an LA-based Yanni and Smith law firm, a powerhouse attorney who represented the Church of Scientology for years before severing ties. In court documents filed last week, Michael expressed concerns about his ex, Lisa Marie, relapsing into drugs and alcohol, along with guns at the family's $1.8 million residence in Calabasas after Ben's tragic death. Lisa Marie Presley's son shot and killed himself in her home, although she was not there at the time, he wrote in papers filed last week. He further alleged, with all due sympathy and respect, this creates a new and unaddressed twofold problem, the safety of the children and the greater likelihood of Presley to relapse into drug and alcohol dependency. The reason I find that story interesting is uh, with a lot less money on the table, uh, I do tend to come across some divorces where you've got people who are um yeah there's a lot of accusations about fear some of them very well founded fear that what one parent has drug or alcohol problems which haven't been dealt with and um, very worried about the children spending time with them and this is a, an ongoing issue which i don't think is very well managed by the by the um by the system shall we say and the other area of it is that also it can be like with this he's talk, he's saying that she's likely to fall back into to drug and alcohol abuse well to you know, keep get full custody of the children on that basis does seem a bit slim um, i do hope they don't turn this into some horrible battle over the children so now we're moving on to talk to uh, a divorce coach who was very kindly here last week sharing his his own personal story and he, we will be talking about how a structured approach to the way you go through divorce can make, help really make things much more peaceful. Hello. 
Hello, Jonathan. Welcome, welcome to the show once again. Oh. And uh, thanks, Susie. Well, let, Glad to be here. So let's get straight straight down to it. Um, I mean, if I'm throwing this at you a little bit, but with that last story about uh, about Miss, Mrs. Presley and what's going on there, um, you know, when when we're fairly friendly with each other and we have a split, that's very different from when there's a drug, alcohol problems. There's uh, maybe a lot of water under the bridge. Are you, what level of conflict are you able to help someone uh, deal with? Because presumably you're working mainly with one person. So I'm guessing yeah. what, whatever's going on, you'd be able to help them as a divorce coach. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's important to recognise where a divorce coach can uh, start and where they can end in the, circum in the, in their, in, in the advice and the, and the coaching they can provide. Um, and often in certain circumstances, there is specialist areas that to be brought in to help and advise and guide that is beyond my expertise um, and you do absolutely you get the cases where there is a element of abuse drugs alcohol um, and a real a real worry about how that separation is going to and divorce is going to take place and um, it's sad that it happens but it does happen and you know you have to make the best of it um, and try and navigate it as positively as, as possible whilst you know respecting the other party in, in what is often a, a difficult circumstance that sometimes they may have lost their lost control of themselves and what what so uh, interesting what you just said there was that uh, there's some demarcations out there and i think it'd be really useful to talk about counseling compared to coaching because it's very different um in many ways i feel is quite different and the place you're in emo emotionally and psychologically to how well you access one or the other uh, or sometimes both at the same time is is different but there's a lot of confusion around it not just from people who are going through divorce but divorce lawyers um and uh mediators so i had le recently a mediator referred someone to me because he said oh she needs he told her she needed to see a, a, a therapist to have some um, a counselling because she was so emotional in the mediation sessions, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And, and he sent her to me to help her, her find someone. But actually, uh, when we talked together, there were many other things that were causing the stress that we didn't in the end she didn't need to go see a counsellor put it that way though if she had done i would definitely or needed it i would definitely have sent her in that direction so perhaps you could say a little bit about how do you know when someone perhaps would benefit from counselling because actually that's quite a good way to you know and when really they just need what you're doing uh, as a coach to help illustrate the, the difference between the two i think that there, there are some deep-rooted aspects that um, are often there from the past, either from the relationship or pre of, of growing up, then some of those areas are not it's certainly a coach's uh, area of expertise to unpack and try and guide uh, a, a client through. Um, and from a coaching perspective, uh, I, I look at where you are now to move you forward, not to look retrospectively of what necessarily has happened and 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 what has been the makeup of that. There, there are some aspects of coaching that you know look at limiting beliefs but those about shifting you forward rather than where they originated from and how you you know you can reflect and, and retrospectively look at it so if, if there is a need to uh, unpack those um, and something needs addressing then you know naturally one will guide them down the specialist area that needs to they need to go go through rather than you know try and make it up which is not where you know as a coach you want to be you want to be able to help them move forward uh, and there are some clients that want to look go and have that and need that counseling therapy aspect uh, and then there are others that say okay the past is the past i now need to um, move forward to get to the other side of this and you know, I, I often say um to use it as a catalyst for positive change in, in in my life and and recognizing that this is a moment in my life i'm naturally going to fear um a whole set of series of emotions but you can start to use those and harness them to move you forward um, if at any point through a coaching um, relationship, there are uh, areas that address that um, I don't have the expertise or don't feel comfortable with, then I will naturally talk to a client and say, you know, I, my, my advice in this scenario is that you, you, we, we seek, you seek out um, advice for that particular area um, uh, through the specialist and expertise that, that's, a, that's available. And so with the, the work that you do, which is much more focused on the, the future, because 
big issue often people have is when they're going through divorce, they they don't think past the divorce. They they can't imagine uh, a happy future, which is obviously going to massively impact on how they then progress through it and what kind of a financial deal they they want because their their, their foundations are not 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 forward thinking. But you have quite a structured way of doing that, don't you? Perhaps tell us a little, yeah, little I, bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I describe I describe it as four C's, having gone through my my own my own divorce um, and helping others navigate it. It's around um, having clarity, clarity on what you want your future life to look like after divorce. And and often when we're going through divorce, we wait for that, that piece of paper to come through to say we're divorced, only then to say, well, I'm divorced, what now? And you can often then go back into a, a sort of emotional roller coaster and start to, to, to hit a, a pit if you're not careful. But actually what I encourage clients to do is to actually use the divorce as a to, to throw everything into the divorce and and design what your future looks like. Now, in many cases, for, with clients who are um, in difficult circumstances or just being told by a partner that their marriage is over, it feels as though that's the wrong thing to be thinking about. But the, the nature of, of looking to what does life look like after divorce and who do you want to be, what's your identity, because our identities often get lost, in, lost because of they're wrapped up in our marriages uh, and we lose the sense of who we are. You know what? What do we want life to look like? Who who are we as an individual? What characteristic traits do we have? We've got that perhaps have been suppressed over the years, and and, and start to design that life beyond the, the the divorce. And and then that as a result, the power of that starts to flip the mind to start to say, okay, I can start to see light at the end of the tunnel beyond the divorce, as opposed to. Well, it's all just grey clouds, and I can't, I can't see the, you know, the wood from the trees. Makes my metaphors. Appreciate that, but it, so it's a uh, getting that clarity in what the future looks like gives you some sort of hope to aim for, a target to aim for, uh, and then helps positively navigate you through um, the challenges that are faced going through divorce, uh, so that you can start to design. And, and if you have clarity on the future you, you, you want, you start to get clarity on the outcome you want from your divorce, which then helps you manage your emotions and helps you manage your mindset. And builds that resilience to, to navigate the the events that get often get thrown at you by a partner who you know wants to press your emotional buttons and get a reaction from you. And um, thank you for that. And and so, uh, what um, when where should would someone be ideally if they were to to come and and, and work with you? What stage of the process? Because it can be a long a long process from the first moment of thinking about divorce to when you're actually um, you know finalized your financial agreement and got your consent order yeah that's a that's a that's a great question and i think there's um a number of core component parts of that there's the initial part of when you're a thinking about separating because that has its own aspects of what does that road look like ahead um if you separated and ready to move forward with the the divorce is almost getting that divorce ready um to understand what are the steps you need to take what are the roads you're going to go down how do you build that support network around you um then it's about understanding and taking control of the process and taking control of the divorce. Um, and if you need that, there's a thread of mindset and, and emotional resilience that covers all through, the, whether you're in the start, the middle, or towards the end, that often I'll have clients in each of those areas because actually they just want to build up that resilience and get back to where they were or where they want to be. Um, and then I get other clients who say, look, I'm in the middle of my financial negotiations and I don't know what to do. Sometimes the advice that I'm getting uh, from my network of uh, either solicitor or friends and family is I, I don't know where to turn and it just feels doesn't feel quite right and how do I apply um, professional negotiating techniques to what is effectively a business transaction at the end of the day with a lot of emotional noise around it um, so there's a number of component parts it, I, it's almost the start in the middle and you know not quite towards the end but you're in that sort of negotiation piece that if you often you've soft felt you've lost control you can then um, start to regain control and start to use the, pro the techniques that professional negotiators use to negotiating your divorce to get the right outcome for you that is still fair and equitable. It's not about trying to you know, take somebody between us. It's not about that, but it's ensuring that you are doing the right thing for you and understanding the, the techniques that others might be applying to you and how do you, how do you respond to those. 
And of course, that's very empowering. And none of this really happens much if you get dragged into court, but it's very useful if you're going into mediation, for example. And, and I think uh, I personally believe that coaching prior to going into mediation can transform the success of that mediation because as that you're more confident aren't you you're more focused and you um and it is that balance of you know you've got to have your own uh, needs at the uh, clearly laid out and boundaries but at the same time as you say making sure it's fair and emotionally that can be hard when you're really angry with the person so uh, i think the the uh, emotional support that you provide the practical support is really essential for people uh, at any stage but especially if they're going into mediation um so how do people get in contact with you obviously on uh, when people watch this they'll be able to you'll be adding a, a link and information but uh, what's what's the best way for people to get hold of you uh, well, I, the website is fearlessdivorce.com, and um, and I, I I operate a uh, what I call a free divorce strategy call. So people can uh, book a call and have a, a free session with me to understand where they are and, and and get them on the right path. And then if there's a right fit, we can see whether there's a, an opportunity to work together. But sometimes there isn't, and that's absolutely fine. But it's in the, uh, nature trying to get people onto the, the right path and feeling more confident by the end of that call. Um, or alternatively, I can be emailed at uh, Jonathan at fearlessdivorce.com and I'd be happy to uh, um, help and advise where, where, where appropriate. And, and one thing I just wanted to make as a final statement is that the resources for nav navigating one's divorce are all within each of us. And a, a job as a coach is just about pulling that out and getting the person onto the right path and, and then taking ownership and feeling empowered by it. Um, and that then often sets them up for a much more positive life after divorce. Um, you can use divorce as a real transformation for you in in, in how in your future life, and, and that's something that people just don't see, and quite rightly they don't see it initially. It's, it's just clouded with um, a lot of anger, frustration, and, and all the, the, the challenges of a emotional roller coaster that come with it. That's a great way to finish. Yeah, and couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much for coming th on the show, Jonathan, and see you again and in a later episode, no doubt. Bye right, for thank now. Thank you. That was very useful. Yeah, so uh, fearlessdivorce.com, and obviously I'll make sure for people watching this when it, uh, when it goes out a bit later, I will add on his uh, contact details. And we're going to do a little bit of learning now and get ready for the Divorce Masterclass. <laughs> We are now at the on the last of the divorce first aid um, uh, areas that are, are covered in the masterclass. You can do with the QR code there. You can access actually, I think, still the whole first section of um, of the course for nothing as as part of the preview. So particularly for those who are early on, I do recommend that you take advantage of that. I've got lots of useful videos and information in there, but. We're going to talk now about disposable gloves. Um, even today, Groucho Marx's words on the subject of divorce resonate. Hollywood brides keep the bouquets and throw away the grooms. So don't think that you can put on a pair of sterile gloves and protect yourself from being tainted by divorce or family breakup. You see, it's not catching. The sterile, gl sterile gloves are to protect the other person, not you from harm, a bit like with the whole mask thing going on at the moment. There's a lot of misconceptions around divorce and many judgments. I, I just certainly remember feeling as if I was somehow infectious uh, when my uh, initially split from my children's father. In fact, in fact, for quite some period of time, all the dinner parties dried up completely and it did begin to feel like I was somehow infectious. Here's some scary stats for you. So if you've been diagnosed with cervical cancer, your likelihood of getting divorced is 40% higher than standard rates, according to these statistics. It's 20% higher if you've been diagnosed with te testicular cancer. So it's very easy for us to listen to that and think, oh, you know, divorce is really, I mean, it can, obviously it can be bad for your health, but you didn't think it was that bad. If both you and your partner have had previous marriages, you're 90% more likely to get divorced than if this had been the first marriage for both of you. It's another statistic, but what's the real truth behind these statistics? 
it's always good to look a little bit further. Norwegian cancer registry researcher Astri Seiss reckons that cervical and testicular cancers are linked to higher divorce rates because they affect sexual activity and afflict mainly young people. In contrast, Seiss also found that breast cancer survivors, an older group, are 8% less likely to divorce than their counterparts who have not had breast cancer. So it's more to do with the ages of the people than anything to do with the divorce. Now let's have a look. Are second marriages doomed to fail? I've, I've certainly heard that uh, stated uh, many times. Well, there's a lot of data that also shows that second marriages should be more successful than first marriages. But this statistic is skewed by serial marriers and no one has yet found a way to take the Larry Kings and Elizabeth Taylors out of the equation. So it's just very hard to actually get to the true data there. But if you're on a second marriage, do not assume that that's going to mean you're, you're more likely to divorce. Busting the divorce myths. Here we go. The following data is from the Office of National Statistics in the UK, but it's been analysed by Harry Benson, Communications Director for the Marriage Foundation in February 2013. He talks about the seven year itch. Apparently it's a myth. For over 40 years, divorce rates have been consistently at their highest between three and six years after the marriage. After peaking between three and six years, the likelihood of a marriage ending in divorce decreases with each year thereafter. Recession raises divorce rates. It's a myth. The divorce trend has remained constant in the UK despite recessions, booms and cultural changes in social attitudes. The other one is that second marriages, as we were saying earlier, are more likely to fail. Luckily, this is also a myth. The second marriage for the husband shows a lower divorce rate than if it is the first marriage, possibly because the first marriage could have been a slide, whereas a second marriage is more likely to be a conscious commitment. You see, it's easy to jump to conclusions and to make judgments based on skewed perceptions of the information at hand. You'll have your own judgments, your own stuff from the past that you will unwittingly and unknowingly dump onto the other person who's navigating the divorce and make their life even harder than it is. So whether it's your uh, spouse that you're having these preconceptions and ideas about or someone that you, you know, care for in your family or in the workplace, just be really aware about the biases and the ideas that you've got in your head because you can uh, actually give them encourage them to think negatively about things that they don't need to. Now that doesn't mean that you have to avoid the person going through divorce like they've got some kind of a disease of course but it's been it does mean you need to have some awareness about how what is happening to that other person is affecting how you feel. So don't withdraw from people who are going through divorce because you're just awkward you don't know what to say you know just going out for a drink with you or spending a little time with you and talking about other things could be a lifesaver for them. Uh, but just be aware of your own judgments and, and that you don't uh, inflict them on them and stay open minded, particularly when it comes to not joining in with um, joining in with uh, battering the, the other person in the, in the, in the marriage, uh, taking sides, not a good idea. I read a book called The Lost Boy a few years ago. Uh, it was about a foster child who encountered prejudice because in the 1970s America, people treated fostered kids as if they must have done something wrong to be cast out by their family. Of course, the reason this child was taken away from his family was because he was being horribly mistreated by his alcoholic and mentally ill mother. But other families didn't want to believe that parents could be cruel to their children. So instead they blamed the children for ending up in foster care. I believe that, hopefully that has changed now, but in the 70s, this was very much the case. Very powerful book uh, called The Lost Boy, I highly recommend it. In the same way, people with rocky marriages may prefer to cast blame on those who are going through divorce, assuming they've done something wrong, rather than recognize that their own relationships may need work, or that marriages can come to a natural, natural end as people change and want to go down different paths in their lives. So please don't judge. Divorce and family breakup can happen to anyone. Helen Rowland once said, when two people decide to get a divorce, it isn't a sign that they don't understand one another, but a sign that they have at last begun to. Now we're coming to our shared story. So prepare to meet Claire.
Hello Claire, thank you so much for joining us and you're on holiday as well so it's particularly kind of you to make time to, to come on the show. Thank you Susie, good evening. Good to have you here and uh, we, we were talking um, just the other week so I'm really grateful that you're coming on here because you yourself, you are actually a professional divorce coach just like Jonathan um, and just like him you've been there and done it but I really uh, resonated with your with your story particularly without giving anything away about sliding down the wall um, do you remember when you told me that so I'd, if you'd be kind enough I'd love you to share you know what was what was how that experience has impacted the way you view other people going through divorce Thanks, Susie. Well, my divorce started very suddenly. Um, one evening in March 2008, um, I had uh, had the day with the children. My children were three and one at the time. My husband came home from work. We fed the kids, put them to bed. He, he made our dinner and we sat down to watch Holby City, as you do on a Tuesday night. And I thought he was a little bit quiet. So I asked him whether he was OK. And he looked at me and all I can remember him saying was, I'm not really okay, no, I've been seeing someone else. And at that moment, my, my life kind of fell apart around me. And that's where the sliding down the wall thing happened. I kind of thought that was something that people did in movies, um, but actually people do it in real life. And I slid down the wall and ended up sitting on the floor in a fetal position, not really understanding what I had just heard and all sorts of questions swirling around my head. Um, I think the first question I asked was, are you leaving me with two children to look after under the age of four? Um, so it was it was very sudden, very brutal. Um, and then my second thought after that was, what can I do to prevent him from walking out of the door? And I decided that the best thing I could do would be to go next door. So I went next door to see my neighbors, stayed there for a couple of hours, um, and then when I came back, he had his bags packed and was ready to leave. Um, and that was the last time that we lived together. So it was it was very sudden. I often compare it to a blanket. You've got your whole life in a blanket in front of you and it gets thrown up into the air and bits of it might fall back on the blanket, bits of it fall to the side, bits of it fall behind you, bits of it in front of you. And that's what it really felt like. The whole of my life was thrown up into the air in, in one evening. So it was very shocking. And when that happened to you, did, did you even know that divorce coaches existed? No, and I, I'm not sure that they even did at the time. There may have been one or two, but no, and there was a lot of counsellors around, but certainly nothing along the lines of a divorce coach. And I wish that they had, because that was what I would have liked at the time. Somebody to help me put my focus back on me, to help me get clarity around my options and my choices, and to help me take back conscious control of my everyday life um because at that moment in time it felt like everything was very out of control very uncertain very confusing and, and massively overwhelming and when when you talk about the that shock and utter confusion that happens when you you first hear the infidelity definitely does make it uh additionally i think difficult but it's just the fact that as you say you're suddenly on your own with these small children and your whole life has has been turned upside down I found when that was happening to me that other people's views were that well, if he's done something as dreadful as that, they, they had a sort of expectation that I was going to, to kind of take some sort of vengeance or be angry and that it's almost like they wanted me to behave like that. And the more I looked at the children and thought, mm, that's not going to work. We have to we have to find a better way to do this. Um, that just seemed, some people seem to find that quite challenging. Did you have anything like that in, in your experience? Because you managed yours your um, quite well by the sound of it from what I, from our conversation. Yes. Um, well, one of the first things that I decided was that the children were the important people here. And so we needed to divorce in a way that was healthy for them and that would enable both of us to support them right the way through. I mean, we had many, many years ahead of us of having to co-parent together these two boys. So one of the first things that I decided was that after I had kind of allowed myself to wallow in my feelings for, I gave myself three months, um, I would be dignified at all times. And I kind of used that as a mantra every single day, dignity at all times. So I made sure that whenever I saw my ex-husband, 
um, that I wore nice clothes, I put on some makeup, I made sure that I felt strong inside, inside myself, um, and I maintained my dignity as far as I could at all times. I mean, there were moments when it went, <laughs> of course, but yeah, most of the time I, I managed to maintain that dignity. And ultimately that was what enabled me to um, build my resilience and handle it really strongly because having that dignity gave me calm and it gave me the ability to look at what I could control, what I couldn't control, and know the difference between the two and focus on what I could control. Um, and ultimately it helped me to find some of the upsides in my situation. I began to realize that there were actually benefits to this. I could uh, have a babysitter and go out when I wanted. I could cook dinner with ginger because my, my ex-husband hates ginger. Um, I could uh, have dinner at whatever time I liked. I could eat with the children. I didn't have to cook twice. All of these things um, I began to see were upsides to my situation and that, that flipped it around for me and made it feel much, much better. I remember feeling a bit guilty as I started to notice the benefits because it's like, oh, I'm supposed to be a victim. But I think what it's really important that you, you, you can be a victim for a while. I love the idea that you, had, you gave yourself three months and it, it is so important uh, not to, yeah, you've got to pick yourself up to an extent because you've got the children. But you do have to allow yourself to grieve and feel. But that's not the time to be trying to go into mediation or have financial discussions. You have to take that space, don't you? Because it is just trauma. And how long do you think it took for that sort of trauma to work its way through? Did you have to do anything in particular to speed up that process? Because some people seem to stay there for a long time. Mm, I think it was interesting because that, that choice that I made to allow myself to wallow for three months, I think started to train my brain. And my brain actually began to feel better after three months because it expected to, because that's what I was telling it was going to do. Uh, so after that three months, I really did begin to, 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 to notice a difference in myself. I think you're right in terms of not entering into uh, the legals at that particular point in time. I wasn't in a place where I could do that. And I was lucky enough when I um, interviewed the, or went to see the first lawyer that I, I met, her first piece of advice, and in fact, the only piece of advice I remember from that first meeting was, you don't have to do anything just yet. Wait until you know what it is you want to do and work out what your priorities are. And that was really important advice to me because it gave me permission not to rush and not to do anything before I was ready. And that, that then helped me with the dignity at all times as well. I didn't feel I was being rushed into doing anything before I was ready. That's fantastic uh, advice as well. So thank you so much for your shared story. And uh, I look forward to catching up with you soon and getting to know even more about the, the work that you do. Thank you Thanks, so much, Susie. Claire. And now we are having our roundup. Uh, just very quickly, I'm going to run again the short workshop video because I really like it and I'm really uh, grateful to the Wellers Law lawyers who let me use kind of the outtakes for some bits of it because I thought they were uh, it was a great way to show how um, human they are and this is the divorce financial workshop that's happening on the 10th of September in um, in the evening in the UK and I would love to do some US ones hint hint if there's any lawyer firms there who would like to do something like this The Divorce Financial Workshop that we've created is interactive. Wellers think the online divorce workshops are a fantastic way of getting in touch with experts. It's not as overwhelming as they as they think. Relaxing, friendly. Of course, with the collaborative law process, matters are more amicable. The more amicable things are, the cheaper it is. Actually, the, the funny thing is, is that I, um, I, I didn't actually initially want to go into this area of law. Professionals that you may need to assist you in the future, be it divorce lawyers, counsellors, therapists. I fell into it and, and now I actually love it because um, you know, my personality is like that. I, I like helping people and I feel like I am giving something back, which is important to me. You're going to get key information that you need sitting at home through the computer. The biggest mistakes that I've come across is burying their head, not dealing with things. Um, family dynamics, you know, if there's a second relationship. Yeah. Using children as a tool against the other. You know, putting assets into trust for the benefit of children. Thinking it's going to be cheap and quick. Um, guardianship um, for children. Inheritance tax. 
um, that's quite a big one. It also provides you with access to other professionals that you may not feel you need to be speaking with at the present time, but you may need to in the future. The, the problem in most cases that is that people are just not well informed and, and keeping people informed um, is extremely important because they also then are aware of their options. I've been collaboratively trained for around 13 years now and I've conducted a number of collaborative matters. I haven't had any that have failed. Collaborative law can be a much cheaper and time efficient solution. It gives you the opportunity to reach an agreement rather than one being imposed on you by the court. It's a really fantastic process to engage with. I trained as a collaborative lawyer because I thought it was really important, particularly with family work, um, to deal with matters amicably and non-confrontationally. Um, and it really does just take some tension and heat out of what could be otherwise quite a nasty situation. Um, and I just feel it's important that families, couples recognise that you can deal with matters amicably. On the Divorce Financial Workshop, we have some brilliant, brilliant specialists there focused on dispute resolution, keeping you out of court, saving you thousands and thousands of pounds and taking the fear of the finances out of the divorce process. And we're recording it and putting it in a special safe place for those of you who perhaps get interrupted by the children or life and we want to make sure that you get the full value out of this workshop. I look forward to welcoming you at our Divorce Financial Workshop. And this is our free divorce group on Facebook that you can come on in and join us and you'll be able to find out more about the Divorce Financial Workshop in there, of course. And we also have our other group, which is not on Facebook. The Not On Facebook group is a secret divorce group where I have lots of additional resources and we have monthly chats and it's very supportive. And now we are ready for our healing so i hope you're ready i can see that uh, our lovely healer Aka is ready she hasn't had an internet crash like we had last week so fingers crossed this is going to be a goodie um, i know some of you may also already be uh, familiar with eft emotional freedom technique um, but i will explain a little bit up front about what she's going to be doing and and i just do encourage you all to give it a go hello Aga. i'm going to bring you in um in, uh, I'm going to give you a little slide first and then I'm going to bring Welcome, welcome Aga Kahinde, Emotional Freedom Technique Do you have a, a name for your business? I mean I've just, I've put uh, Good evening <laughs> Hello. No, well, it's, it's, it's my name I'm also a professional coach like my um, pre-speakers so we are in a really good company thank you um, so it's just simple Aga Kahinda and that's the name um, when you can find me um, as my business and Aga can you tell us a little bit about the, what you're going to be um, helping uh, offering and sharing with us to, today to round off the show Right, so um, I've just been listening and it's amazing um, what you guys are doing and what you're talking about and it's so inspirational. And I suppose um, what I do in my day-to-day -day work is I do help people going through challenges, challenging times in their life and the common denominator for all of the things that I'm working with is stress. So I would like to offer um, a little bit of um, EFT for stress and what will uh, probably be the, the most um, important thing that we will um, use EFT for is to reduce the stress as quickly as possible um, and I suppose um, you know you can use it for yourself you can use it for your children it's such a versatile tool um, and we know that the daily exposure to stress um, to stress conditions may cause us a stress injury you know moral trauma um, and possibly even lead to the you know post-traumatic stress disorder in the future um, so when you find yourself in the constant state of high stress and anxiety, it, it, may, it, it may just make you feel dis detached, disassociated, almost like your experiences are not um, real. So, you know, establishing order externally and internally, it's, uh, it's absolutely 
paramount to our mental health and well-being. So, um, yes, that's what I would like to offer you today. Is that okay? Thank you. That sounds perfect, and uh, and for people who aren't going through divorce, going to find this equally useful because let's face it, everyone has forms of stress in their life, and it can be so damaging uh, that we do need different ways to deal with it. Um, would you like me? I forgot your answer when I asked you earlier, because entirely up to you. We can stay like this, or I can move to the next um, uh, section where you continue, and we see you just the same. But there's a little bit of, of music underneath. Which do you prefer for EFT? What do you think is most appropriate? I really don't find either either way. That's either way you 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 do it. It's absolutely we'll, fine. We'll experiment with the music. Let's see how it goes, just to underpin. But I'll keep it nice and low so we can hear what you say. So do you want to give okay. people just before we go into that any uh, little kind of a little bit of prep for so people who've never done it? Is there anything they need to know in advance? Absolutely. So I just want to explain very quickly that EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques and, and now it's more known as a tapping and is because it involves a gentle tapping on the particular parts of our body, um, on our face and our upper body and we tapping very gently on the pressure points. Um, sometimes it's described as a psychological acupuncture as the tapping points are located on the same meridians um, which are used in the traditional acupuncture but instead of using the needles we are using the two fingers and we're gently tapping and we know through the clinical research that stimulating those pressure points sends a um, signal back to some of the stress centers of the brain and the amygdala and the hippocampus and calm that part of the brain down um, so what people then report is um, they feeling much calmer physically and they're feeling um, an emotional sensation of just being calmer and um, and I think what's really important for us is that increased ability to think more clearly about this um, things that we are tapping on so it's really important for us and EFT is used um, to rapidly change negative feelings reduce stress negative self-limited thoughts um, and it's really easy to learn and which you can then self-administer at, at any time really it combines element of um, mindfulness so mindfulness we all know about it now a little bit of exposure therapy so we're actually bringing those negative emotions up we're facing them and we're calming ourselves um, down and acceptance and positive affirmation which um, which is absolutely amazing and that somatic element the tapping itself on the body it makes biological changes as well so we're reducing the amount of um, stress hormones like testosterone adrenaline and uh, it's absolutely amazing um, so um, wow. yeah brilliant. should we, brilliant. Should we just go? <laughs> we'll get, go so I'm going to do go I'm going to go bring in the music and I will disappear because people watching this will be able to see me so I'm not going to have them watch me doing the tapping but I am going to be doing it here so you can see but we don't have to share that with everybody yeah. right everyone get your fingers ready Get your fingers ready. So I just just preempt that when you find yourself in the any distressing state, you can use this. I'm just going to show you a basic technique, and you use this technique by starting from focusing on the negative emotion, which is sometimes feels counterintuitive because we don't want to focus on negative emotions. We're so used to doing affirmations, um, you know, bringing the fears and anxiety down, not wanting to face. We like putting this mask saying, yeah, we're fine. We're going to be OK. But with tapping, we actually want to focus on those negative emotions, the fear, the anxiety, the worry, the sadness, anything that is bothering you. And we're starting from rating. You can write it down on in your mind and um, this distress of discomfort and we put that on the scale between zero and ten and zero being you know not distressed at all we're absolutely relaxed and fine and ten we are in extreme distress we're doing that because it is subjective units of distress someone could put number five and it's a lot for him and someone can put number ten and that's exactly the same feeling so we need to put it um as equally for, for us um, and then to maintain the mental focus we need to um, set up the statement so you capture your problem in the statement and you will repeat the statement three to four times uh, while gently start tapping on the side of your hand okay so I thought it would be good to tap on the um, the common issue which is stress but for all of us when we're going through a challenging times um, that stress comes up to us in the form of racing mind. So I thought racing mind would be good um, and it affects us on, on any stage and any ages as well. So you can do it for yourself. And if you have smaller children or even teenagers, you know, you can, you can tap on that with them. So just start from taking a deep breath. So in and out, deep but gentle breath. 
and notice the race of thoughts that is happening in your mind right now. If that doesn't happen right now, think about the last time that you had this racing mind when, you know, the thoughts were just coming and you just, you, you couldn't stop them. Um, I must say this often um, is how your mind is just before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning and it can either make another sleepless night or set you up for the day with unhelpful mindset. So just for a moment, I want you to observe and notice how active your mind is right now and put it on this scale between zero and 10. And now gently start tapping on the back of your hand, just here, and we just very gently tap. I would suggest doing that with your dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, gently tap on this flashy bit of your left-hand side. And you repeat after me, either out loud or in your head. Why we're saying out loud is because we're using all the senses, we're using the hearing sense, and that creates that mindfulness. It's a little bit more stronger. And then just repeat after me. Even though I have this racing mind, I accept myself anyway. And we breathe in between. Even though I have this never stopping thoughts, I love and accept myself. Even though I'm frustrated, disappointed with myself, and just simply exhausted, I love and accept myself anyway. Even though I'm exhausted and my mind is just keep going and never give me a break, I give myself permission to relax and accept how I feel right now. Now we're taking two fingers and just gently start tapping right at the beginning of the eyebrow. And repeat after me. What is my mind racing about? It doesn't matter which side you're tapping, you can change your hands if that's more comfortable. And then we're moving on to the side of your eye. All this issue and problems jumping in my head. Under your eyebrow. All those racing thoughts. under your nose, those racing thoughts. On your chin, just on this indentation here, my mind is constantly on alert, constantly looking for solutions. Just tap gently on your collarbone, solutions to all my issues and problems. Now we're tapping under your armpit, just on the on the, on the level of your bra, if you're a woman. <laughs> and it seems like I have a lot on my mind. And on the top of your head, this racing mind. We're going to do one more round, just the beginning of your eyebrow. It keeps me awake and I can't relax. the side of your eye but I know my mind keep racing because it's scared I won't be safe if I relax under your eye so my mind is racing to keep me safe under your nose it doesn't know that now is safe to relax on your chin so I give myself permission to relax right now on the collarbone now is safe to relax 
and just let go of all these racing thoughts. I'm safe to relax. On the top of your head, now I can relax. very last time I'm ready to gently quiet this racing mind on the side I'm safe to leave all my problems and anxieties and worries until tomorrow under your eye more I tap more I relax and I can already sense my mind being quiet under your nose I'm letting off I feel safe and I'm relaxed now. So put your hand right on top of your chest. Take a deep breath in, out, and in your head, re-rate that score using the sats again. You should feel much better now. So tapping on those meridian points while concentrating on accepting and resolving the negative emotion allow us to quickly restore balance state. Um, you know, we're just mindful in acknowledging the state we're in and using tapping and breathing with compassionate acceptance um, and positive affirmation immediately calms us down. So I hope you felt that just for a minute. That was lovely. Thank you so much, Aga. And I think the more I do these tapping, the more less weird it feels and the more uh, powerful effects I begin to to feel from it and uh, yeah and there's so much science behind it thanks for giving this very potted version uh, behind that but there's there's, there's a lot behind uh, what's going on there and I really appreciate you coming on so um, and of course you'll be uh, I will let you know where this is all going live and that you'll be able to put in information so people can find out a bit more from you okay thank you thank, thank you so much for inviting me Thank you, Aga. Bye for now. Oh, wonderful. Bye. So, oh, calm. I've probably got little red bits all over me from where I've been doing that. So, uh, just before we go and uh, do my little round, I've had we've had some comments, which is nice. Um, I haven't seen any come in from um, Facebook today. Uh, I think people tend to watch it on the replay, but it's great to see the uh, that Twitter has got a, a few coming in. Um, Thank you, JB, for saying that. Thank you for sharing knowledge on here. You're helping more people than you know, which is great to be appreciated. Obviously, we've got the usual, oh, stay married, problem solved. But obviously, you know, you, uh, Jeremiah Hartz, perhaps you'd like to tell that to the, the husbands and sometimes the wives, of course, as well, who decide to leave. I mean, sometimes you're just stuck. You don't have the choice of, of uh, whether you get divorced or not in many cases. So that's um, uh, a good Good thing to hope for but sadly not the reality and um, but I totally agree with you um, you don't want to be wife hating and you don't want uh, to misuse the lawyers lawyers can be great but you've got to use them in the right way just like everything else so thank you though for all of you for your comments I really appreciate it and anyone you know who's going through divorce a family separation let them have access to this show because uh, we are trying to change the way people think about and deal with divorce and on the battlefield of divorce, in the war of family separation, always, always make peace your weapon of choice.